kind of want to somewhat gear the, the this conversation into going th to the second question. Um, um, and this comes back to, you know, your, the process of, um, as you were talking about your process, my process, et cetera, and where we, where we situate ourselves. So um, yeah, as new practitioners, um, where do we situate ourselves in this murky space? Um, and based off that, how do we create our audiovisual essay? So you were talking about um, the Middlebury method, um, et cetera. And you were talking about how you have this observation. And after that observation, you essentially try to sometimes, you know, dig deeper into it and sometimes not. Um, and to what extent do you think your, you know, work is academic and what is the academic value of, um, of the um, Psycho Raging Bull uh, audiovisual essay, for example? Hmm, it's a good question. On one hand, I have to say that I think all of my work on some level is academic because my background is academic. Yeah. So I'm inherently bringing that to everything that I do. And the audience that I'm sharing it with is primarily academic. That's not because I'm excluding another audience, but that's just the, that's how I was exposed to this form. That's how I first got gotten. That's the circle I swim in. And also I love being in that circle. Like yeah. I, I, I love all the people <laughs> who I interact with. Um, so that is on one hand rooted in what I do the other I mean I think you know I think Catherine Grant and others have said this like scholarship is what scholars do right so if you think of yourself as a scholar you by extension everything that you do could be considered a piece of scholarship um the raging psycho video I don't think is meant as a piece of scholarship I think it could be included as a piece of research yeah like what I'm interested in is and, and you might notice this by a lot of my projects is I'm, I'm interested in making a bunch of different videos and then maybe trying to piece them together as part of a larger project that could be academic. Right. So this is not something I've really talked about publicly, but I'm, I'm very much interested in thinking about Hitchcock in the 21st century, generally what he means, how he's, how his work is manipulated, how it engages with the digital, um, all of these questions. And so for me, I'm interested in, in that as a question I'm interested, I'm, I'm fascinated by, you know, on one hand, there's a, I think there's a problem in that a lot of video essays tend to pump up the same directors, Hitchcock being one of them. And I am complicit in that. I've made a ton of videos about Hitchcock. So I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm part of the, I don't want to say problem, but you, you know what I'm, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. But I am, I am very much interested in this question of why do some why are some directors or some films more, more likely to be made the subject of videographic criticism than others, right? So, I mean, if you look back at the writing, the writers that I, you know, admire for like a lot of the, the Kaye critics and whatever, it was like Hawks and Hitchcock were the two, yeah. whatever. But Hawks is not, I mean, there are some great video essays out there about Hawks. I'm doing my Rio Bravo project, you know, which I don't even know if that's a video essay, but whatever, we can get into that. But Hawks does not have as many video essays as Hitchcock. Now, one could be, I think Hitchcock's a far more popular filmmaker. He's endured more. He's, you know, there, there are a bunch of reasons, but I, I think that's an interesting question. And so for me, if they're academic, and this is a long-winded way of saying, if Raging Psycho is academic, it's not academic yet. It depends on how I make use of it later on. Right. If, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So I'm not trying to like, I would never submit Raging Psycho to an academic journal. I mean, maybe someone could, but it would have to have some type of underlying theoretical framework yeah. or something that was getting at it because all, all it really does is take the clip from Martin Scorsese and use that to make a cool editing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, th so that's how I think about my work is I, I, I'm thinking like, okay, I think this is interesting. Like, again, this is kind of the make first think later type right. approach. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. How about, how about you? How do you, how about you? Um, how do you, how do you situate yourself? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's murky. It's murky. I mean, the thing is that <laughs> um, I would, I would definitely follow, you know, I'm, I'm more of a conservative in the, in the whole um, field and I would definitely follow the, um, the whole kind of academic process of, you know, doing research first, um, trying to get to know as much as you can about your subject, obviously within the limitations of how much time you have. 
Um, and that's what that's what, something we could discuss later as well. You know, how how do you balance? How do you how much research do you have, actually have to do? How much you know to make an audiovisual essay and stuff like that? But um, so yeah, so I'm I'm also kind of just generally thinking about how we could kind of get these academic values and somewhat transpose them into the audiovisual medium. Um, so at the University of Groningen, like that's we've also been thinking about that recently and. We teach students there about specific kind of uh, modes of manipulation that you could do on your editing software, for example, like split screens, um, and uh, for example, like how you could re how you could essentially represent concepts um, audiovisually. So um, that's something that the audiovisual medium is not as good as it's not so good, and it doesn't do it as well as the textual medium, for example, representing concepts. So. Um, Definitely, I do situate my work um, within kind of the academic sphere, particularly because it's the process of that academic research that defines it as such. Um, and from what I understand from your answer that you just gave now, um, for you, it's more about kind of, um, as you said, you get that observation and then you kind of test that observation um, and you, you know, make some end product. But does that end product, uh, that end product doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily um, academic. I mean, um, primarily because, you know, it doesn't general, generally, it might not generally adhere to kind of those academic values that we already have played out, but I'm not, but of course those can be somewhat, um, these poetic works somewhat transgress those, um, values already. Like they kind of test them right. and what the boundaries of academia are in general. Um, and the thing is, I, I think if, you know, BC is going to become, I mean, it is a it is a you know fairly um, fairly kind of widespread practice in film studies right now. But I'm trying to envision it, you know, in you know the whole of humanities. I mean, we have digital humanities, and VC is somewhat part of that. But um, you know, the humanities itself also is um, somewhat in a crisis. Um, I know, like a lot of a lot of governments, they um, they stop funding the humanities to some extent. So if if a government's like if the Ministry of Education is like, okay, we have to make budget cuts in education in higher education, the first one to go is obviously most of the time is the humanities because um, people can't enjoy anything. <laughs> sorry. Because <laughs> we can have no fun or enjoyment in society. Everything has to be. Yeah. No, sorry, God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to, you know, you have to have um, some sort of profitable, you know, um, outcome. Um, I mean, that's how some governments might view it, of course. But, um, but yeah, so I was just thinking, you know, um, I think the first step to kind of um, get to that is, you know, thinking about how we could transpose these ac academic values onto the audiovisual medium, creating some sort of audiovisual work that, um, you know, uses its own affordances. Um, but at the same time, it um, kind of st uh, sticks to those academic values anyway. And in doing so, by kind of also disseminating audiovisual works on sites like YouTube, Vimeo, et cetera, that are, you know, places that are more, that the general public can access, then we might kind of see some sort of transformational transformation within, um, you know, the dynamic between the general public and um, academia. So it might be too ambitious, but, um, but yeah, that's, <laughs> it's uh, mostly, uh, yeah, just a hypothetical situation. No, I understand what you're saying. And I think it's also important that we should note that, you know, saying something is academic or non-academic is not necessarily judging its quality, <laughs> right? Or judging its value or whatever. Like it's just different. And this is something that we've I've encountered before with saying like, you know, okay, I actually, I actually don't think that's videographic criticism. That doesn't say that it's bad, right? Like it could be a brilliant video that's evocative and great and what have you. Um, but it's just different. And I think that these talking, this is what trying to figure out what a form is and can be and what it does, like that's important. And so like when I say that my raging psycho video is not academic or when I say something, someone else's video is not academic, that doesn't mean it's not great and insightful and original and worth watching. Um, yeah, of course. And the thing is that um, um, I think it's good that you pointed that out just like to, to give our audience some sort of disclaimer. Um, but yeah, since right. like, yeah, I mean, um, the thing is, like, if you approach it from a more academic approach, so where you're researching into a film, trying to find out some sort of theoretical framework, um, and I, I mean, generally, my mission as well is to kind of use that knowledge, use that method, and to make it appropriate to the general public. Um, and in doing so, like, you know, the general public can, might have some sort of 
um, ideological trans transformational shift. Um, right. Yeah, I, f I kind of uh, forgot where I was going with this, but um, yeah. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, in interviewing Adrian Martin on the podcast, he talks about this a little bit. I think this might be what you're getting at, which is, you know, I asked him, he's someone who has obviously is a film critic, but also has roots in academia um, and who has this incredible knowledge of, of film and yeah. film theory and film history and makes video essays for uh, Film Crant in yeah. uh, the Netherlands and with Christina Alvarez Lopez. And I asked him, I said, you know, are you worried that sometimes your videos are too, like, the you know, you know how, how do you worry about, you know, your audience is a non-academic audience. So how do you balance your, you know, your the academic nature of a lot of your work with the audience? And he, he made the point, well, you know, obviously audiences can follow along with that. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a PhD, so, and I can follow along, you know, but he was making the point that, you know, even when you write a film review for a newspaper, you might make references to an obscure director, an obscure film. And if you have an audience and you have an engaged audience that is encountering this name or this film or this concept or this book over and over again, the goal is to make it so that they can watch and read the piece without perhaps knowing the full context of that. But it also is referencing them enough so that someone might say, oh, well, you know, I like Adrian Martin as a film critic. He keeps mentioning this person. I'm going to go check them out. And then yeah. they're able to do that. And so that's what I think about a lot in these kind of the academic video essays. And I think that's what's so powerful about them as a form is that because I think the academic video essayist always needs to think about the non-academic audience on some level, especially if their video, I mean, I guess if they're just going to share their video at a conference or whatever, they don't really need to. But I yeah. think if they wanted to have a life online on YouTube or Vimeo, then they need to because someone will encounter it and you need to you need to think about that audience. Yeah, I definitely um, I definitely agree. The thing is that I've also been thinking about that while creating my videos, because I also want to generally, you know, um, kind of somewhat move out of academia, like not in terms of like moving out of um, it's um, how um, academics think or the you know academic process, but just um, catering my videos more to the general public. Um, and, and, you know, what goes, the questions that go on in my mind is like, how can I actually do that without using kind of, you know, complex jargon, um, you know, this, um, kind of, um, being, being extremely complex and to an audience that might not know anything about, um, you know, Gilles Deleuze or, um, I don't know, uh, what a circular economy is, um, or stuff like that, you know, but, um, and that's, and your work also is invaluable in like your work on what deformative criticism is. And so trying yeah. to take, trying to take, that's a great video that you've made and trying to take that jargon and explain it to someone who maybe wasn't lucky to, like I was to have Jason Mattel as a yeah. professor, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that, it's great what you're doing as well, trying to be this bridge between two worlds. Yeah. And, and that's what you're doing as well with the podcast, et cetera. Um, and I think audiovisual essays, they're just the fact that you could put audiovisual essays as, you know, it's a digital medium that you could put on these um, on these video sharing platforms or already is one step into um, that process where, you know, you're bridging that gap. Um, but, you know, generally I'm also thinking about how could we kind of take these uh, like YouTube aesthetics, for example, um, uh, and take them and kind of bring them into the creation of the audiovisual essay process. Um, that means that obviously the academic rhetoric will not be there anymore. Um, and obviously videos will probably be much faster because, uh, you know, um, people watching YouTube, have their like you, you want to have snappy, um, you know, editing on, uh, on YouTube because, you know, people's attention span has been gotten used to that, you know, snappy editing, right? So I've been thinking about these things and trying to kind of create some sort of melange of um, you know, all these different aspects. And it is very difficult because um, if, you've been, if you've been like, you know, uh, your brain has been wired to think in that academic process, you know, in university, et cetera, right. um, to be as clear and concise as possible, not, not, not to have some sort of counter argument within the logical evolution of your argument, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so I'm just, uh, I, I guess what I'm tr just trying to say, it's, um, it's difficult, but yeah, if you have any thoughts about that, um, yeah, please, uh, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think that's the, that is a great, that's a great question. Um, I, I think 
you know, my, my in thinking about your work, you know, I th- I think it's interesting that you've chosen YouTube as a platform. Yeah. Um, because on the this is something we talk about on the video essay podcast, and I'm I'm I have like an academic interest in in YouTube as a medium that yeah. I've been kind of developing, and uh, I, between you and I, I'm thinking about perhaps maybe having that be my research proposal going into grad school. But but we'll see we'll see what happens. If you have any good reading recommendations on YouTube, let me know. Yeah. But, and that goes includes you in the audience. Leave it in the comments, please. Um, is that there is a difference between YouTube and Vimeo? There's an aesthetic difference, but there's also a community difference in that I think you would find that a majority of scholars are operating on Vimeo, whereas non-scholars are operating on YouTube. And so I, I thought it was interesting that you are, are operating on YouTube, which I think is great. And of course, there are scholars on YouTube and there are non-scholars on Vimeo, of course, but as a general breakdown. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with what kind, are you trying to reach a new audience or are you trying to cater to an existing audience? Um, in that YouTube, you're gonna, if you're a YouTube video essayist, I've talked with Grace Lee about this, you are trying to, you're thinking about the algorithm, right? Yeah. And that could be because you just want people to watch your videos, obviously, or because you are trying to monetize your videos, which is obviously super fair. Um, whereas with Vimeo, I get the sense that a lot of times it's because it 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 looks sleeker. There's more you can do as far as um, adding it to existing academic groups that exist on Vimeo. The showcase feature is very popular for video graphic critics who are trying to kind of put all their work in one place. I know I use that often. And so I think and I think a Vimeo video, there's some, there's just something about it that looks crisper better when it's embedded on in transition or yeah. something like that. So that I think is an aesthetic in and of itself. Whereas with YouTube, it's all about the thumbnail, the title, uh, the, uh, the, the tags, uh, who, who you're reaching. And so I think that is inherently going to shape not only how the video is presented, but the video itself. Um, and, and then it's just two different things. Both are equally valid. It just depends on, it just depends on what you want, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, indeed. Like Vimeo is more kind of like, kind of showcasing your portfolio, right? It's like, um, it's more, you don't have these like, um, featured or you don't have, it's not a, it's not really a social media platform where you could, um, I don't know where like others could go onto there and find your video. Well, you would have to link your video somewhere. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And, and the thing is on YouTube, we see, like, I, I was looking at, you know, nerd writer, um, and various other, um, YouTubers as well. Um, wisecrack as well, to some extent, they do some, uh, like uh, they do some videos about film um, and uh, and School of Life as well. They do some about uh, cinema as well. And I was looking at them and I was like, um, um, what, you know, if, if they created this kind of fan base on YouTube and I think YouTube gives you that opportunity to connect even to a greater degree as opposed to Vimeo. Um, and, the, and yeah, as you were saying, you know, Vimeo, it might seem like it is just, you know, everyone becomes you know, they, they get structured within this continuous circle where, um, you know, people working in VC or, you know, working in the field, um, you know, if they're all uploading on Vimeo, then they're all, it's just going to go through there and everyone's going to get stuck in that realm. Um, while probably YouTube could offer, you know, you know, bridging that gap as we were talking about and expanding to, um, you know, various audiences. Right. And I, and I, you know, I think also, you know, I don't go, I, YouTube is, much more as feels more, more like a social media site than Vimeo. Yeah. Like I, I go to YouTube when I'm bored and I'm like, all right, let's, I'm just going to watch something for, I got six minutes to kill. Yeah. Whereas a Vimeo, I, I don't do that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, I mean, I might go to audio visual C or something and see what's new there or what have you. But for Vimeo, I'm, I, I'm more, I know, I know what I'm looking for or I'm brought there because someone has tweeted the link or it's embedded somewhere. Um, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, YouTube is more of a, uh, yeah, it just caters to the general public more, um, and it's more in, more for the entertaining potential. Um, but it's also, you know, it's easily, it's also democratizing, um, just generally yes. speaking, you know, what creators could do. Um, and for sure. you know, Vimeo doesn't have monetization, right? So um, yeah, so uh, eventually, you know, an audiovisual essayist could. Um, you know, if they strike, I think if they strike a plausible balance between, you know, academic, um, 
an academic audiovisual essay and, you know, gearing towards the general public, you know, at some point you can get your channel monetized. And there are a lot of these, um, I mean, this is not, this has nothing to do with film per se, but there are a lot of YouTubers who, um, you know, they work on, I don't know, economics, for example, you know, they try to understand, right. um, you know, interest rates in a specific country or um, stuff like that. Um, or they try to, you know, ask, answer questions about, you know, just general, um, just general knowledge that um, we don't necessarily know about. Um, and yeah, that's where I, I feel like I could step in, you know, bringing that academic knowledge there. Yeah. Um, I just want to um, somewhat kind of wrap uh, yeah, the, the second question. I mean, I wish we could talk so much more about it. There's so much more to discuss, but um, uh, yeah. So um, I was just thinking, you know, what would work, you know, that kind of um, collaborates between, you know, the more academic, the videographic scholarly work and deformative criticism, what, what, what would that look like? I mean, um, and how could we kind of bridge those two together, which are currently on kind of opposite poles? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. So how would we, you're saying the formative criticism and non-deformative criticism, how would we yeah. bring them together? Yeah, how could we, yeah, how could we like, you know, get kind of synthesize these two forms within an audiovisual essay? Um, cause right now they're on like radical, they're radically somewhat opposing each other and there's this whole debate, you know, in, uh, the field itself, right. like is deform deformative criticism academic enough? Um, but you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn from DC and bring that into, um, the more scholarly videographic work as well. Right. I'm, I'm by no means an expert on deformative criticism, but I'll do my best. And yeah. I would encourage people to go look at the work of Jason Mattel in particular yeah. on this. Um, in his work on singing in the rain, right. it's called deformant in the rain. And he's done all these great videos. Deformative criticism. I know it's, it, it, it's operating within a broader tradition in Jason has tied it to digital humanities. And also yeah. just, uh, you know, deformative criticism is not a phrase that is unique to videographic criticism. Yeah. And as best as I can describe it, it, it has to do with kind of breaking a film or uh, imposing some type of uh, editing function or manipulation uh, as a way to try and kind of understand how it works. Um, so some examples of Jason's work would be taking singing in, a, in the rain and arranging, arranging it from the sh shortest shot to the longest shot, Yeah, right? That, that's one example. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer to your question other than, Again, I think deformative criticism is academic in nature because, again, academics do it. And I also think because you're dis you are using that form to contribute to new knowledge about the film. Yeah. Now, what I think is different is I think that there requires a level of interpretation on behalf of the scholar in looking at their own work or of another scholar looking at someone's deformative piece and then interpreting that work and what it means Whereas a, a, a more, uh, you know, a, something that we might more easily recognize as an audiovisual essay will have its argumentation contained within the form itself, right? So yeah. it, can, it can kind of be a standalone piece. Um, as far as blending the two, I mean, I think that I could easily see, and perhaps someone has done this, you know, some type of deformation being incorporated into a, a broader video essay and then kind of contextualizing that deformation and what it means. Um, I'm sure someone must have done that. Um, but I think for me, it's more, I, I definitely would consider deformative criticism as academic for those reasons. I just think that it probably requires a level of knowledge before going into it to truly understand what the videographic critic is doing, right? Like if you were just on Vimeo and you found some of Jason's videos, you might think, oh, these are really cool or whatever, but you may not be able to tie them to some type of broader tradition yeah. in digital humanities and criticism or what have you. But I think you could still take something away from it. Like you still learn something about how the film is, is constructed. Yeah. Right? 
yeah um yeah thanks for that answer the thing is that um yeah i think does deformative criticism or i was also just generally like kind of um thinking about just the general poetic approach um um but yeah so does deformative criticism um aren't you already somewhat doing that when you're creating you know if you're creating a scholarly videographic work because you are essentially anyway you are breaking apart that whole film you know cutting up segments of it um putting your voiceover for example and creating just this new product and in doing so you are adding you know that layer of discourse through that kind of digital audiovisual essay i i think you are on some point and again i'm not an expert on this so i don't yeah. want to pretend to be something that i'm not um but i think what one point that a deformative critic might make is that a lot of these deformations they are um they are strict in that you are taking a rule and applying it to a film yeah right so for example you are not when, when you arrange singing in the rain from shortest shot to longest shot you are not really making a ton of decisions as the editor or as yeah. the critic right yeah. like you have you've have, you've have come up with this rule this ethos of the or not ethos uh this a computational um yeah yeah right this yes and this and, and you've decided that that is what the video is going to be where the videographic critic in an essay is not there there aren't there aren't these like arbitrary rules right, that are right. there and so I, I i think that's where the deformative aspect comes in yeah right and obviously there are some deformations that require some artistic license and you can do them in different ways um but for the most part, I think that would be it's it's the con, like the Middlebury method in particular is very much concerned with constraint, right? Like the 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 the, the scholarship and sense of image workshop begins with a, the first week is just these exercises that include you know multi screen voiceover yeah. um, epigraph, and the Middlebury method is really concerned with having restraints on you so that you can work through different ways that range from the poetic to the explanatory. Uh, the different rhetorical modes for videographic criticism. And I think deformative is one example of an, an extreme constraint that right. leads to something that is um, not, doesn't give the videographic as much, you know, not, not, it's a lot of playing around, but it's a, it's a focused playing around. Right. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's nice to keep things open, right. To find out what works for you right. and your own argument. Um, and just to kind of round up, um, this question and to move on to the next one um do you think uh you know the more poetic work um is it more of a um you know or should the audiovisual essay be um a mode of merely a mode of communication or should it also be a method to actually conduct that academic research so and that and this is kind of the kind of differing poles that we see right. in the poetic work and the scholarly videographic work um, I mean, it could be both, of course, as we have been kind of mentioning, um, you know, that observation, you could have an observation and, um, you know, kind of execute that on your editing software. And I, I don't know, do some sort of kind of playfulness, do some sort of deformative criticism there, which will lead to more insights into the work. And then eventually you could create some sort of explanatory audiovisual essay. But yeah, just to um, yeah give some context. But yeah, please. I mean, I'm... I personally think the best video essays are both. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's funny when I remember when I, I, I mentioned going up to the scholarship and sound image workshop and writing that article right, when I had no idea what videographic criticism was. And I remember one of the things that Jason said to me when I interviewed them for the article was that he said, you know, very few times have I read an academic paper that has made me laugh, that has made me cry, that has had me walking away feeling emotional. And that for him and I think a lot of people and for Chris Keithley and for me as well, that is the most exciting thing about this form. Now, does, that's not to say that, you know, works that don't do that aren't also great. There are many that I enjoy that are not aspiring to that. Yeah. But I, I don't think that we should walk away from that. And I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of finishing, I'm not sure when this conversation will be released, but I'm in the process of finishing up a episode of the video essay podcast talking with John Gibbs um, and Douglas Pye, who has a new edited collection 
think I have it sitting right here, um, on the work of Victor Perkins and trying to think of it through how about how the work of Victor Perkins could be used to think of videographic criticism. And I think it's this emphasis on the personal of returning to the films that you love, of talking about your uh, a visceral reaction you've had to them, your own curiosity. I think that there should be, I think that's should be a part of scholarship. And I think that's sometimes what's rooted in the best scholarship. And so for me, I like video essays that do both, but I'm not prepared to say one should be, it should, they should be one or the other. Yeah, I do think that they should strive to have both, but I do love works that are only poetic and works that are only explanatory or I forget the distinction that you made, but it was something similar to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. I think the, um, you know, the beauty, I agree with you, like the beauty lies in, you know, this wide range of kind of poles that we have constantly oscillating or trying to find a balance between them or whatever you prefer. Um, but generally speaking, you know, you know, videographic criticism, we need that openness because it is still in the process of becoming. And without that openness, we wouldn't right. necessarily kind of find out or like figure out new methods of how we like new methods we could integrate within it. So it could kind of move on to other directions, for example. Um, and right. that and experimentation say... kind of, yeah, is a general, um, also generally it, it started as, you know, the scholarly videographic work started as also an experimentative kind of output but then again um yeah so yeah no and i and i think you know chloe galley berlin has said i think she said this to me when i interviewed her on the podcast that video essay the term has kind of become this umbrella term it's 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 more describes a community of people who are interested in similar things yeah and i think that's right you know i have the video essay podcast I am not unaware that the video video essay is a deeply flawed term for many reasons. The name of the podcast came about because I sent a list of things of names to Catherine Grant. Yeah. And she said, Oh, I think you should go with the video essay podcast because of the most recognizable. And I think that that has helped the podcast to grow and people spread word, people know what it is immediately. But we have to recognize that videographic critics or audiovisual critics or whatever what have you, you know. I think we need to be careful though, I, I will say is because not everything can be a video essay, right? And we've alluded to this earlier, but videographic critics draw from a, a variety of critical and artistic traditions, Yeah, found footage filmmakers, video artists, um, obviously, you know, written forms of written film criticism, like the detailed criticism of Victor Perkins that I just mentioned. But you know, the a video essayist may be influenced by a found footage filmmaker, but a found footage filmmaker doesn't necessarily consider themselves a video essayist because found footage is inherently about reappropriating footage to create something new, to create a film of its own that is yeah. not necessarily trying to be critical, right? That is not necessarily trying to be a piece of film or, or television or whatever criticism. And so I think that while I do believe we need openness, I do think that subgenres in trying to distinguish between different forms of video essay. And we could talk about that for several days, um, but I, I do think that is important. And we yeah. do need to recognize that there are different forms and traditions and practices. And that if we just throw, if, if we just throw everything under the umbrella term video essay and don't try and you know divide it up and parse through it, then we're just hurting the form as it tries to develop. And it's only right. gonna become more confusing more loose and ill-defined and harder to advocate for. So I, I am a proponent of, of that yeah. um, for sure. All right. Um, yeah. So if you want to know more about um, these taxonomies, uh, Miklos Kiss and Thomas Vandenberg have somewhat, they've, they've uh, created, um, well, they've categorized some aspects of the video essay and I'll, and I'll link that below. Um, but yeah, I wish we could talk about those that those kind of traditions in depth, more in depth, but um, you know, a lot has been said about it. Mm -hmm.